So the old covenant, covenant, by the way, is just a word for promise. The old covenant, the old promise, was conditional. It was a conditional promise. And with both covenants, they require a mediator. The old covenant had the high priest, the high priest, and it had blood, a sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb. Back in those days, by the way, if you made a promise between two people, it was a bloody promise. They would take an animal, sacrifice it, separate it into two parts. The two parties making the agreement would walk between them. They would look at one another and say, basically, if either of us breaks this agreement, then what's done to this animal should be done to us. That's how they made a, an agreement. That's how they signed on the bottom line. So that was the promise that was, that's uh, typically made between two parties. But when we see in the Old Testament, God makes his covenant, his promise with his people. He doesn't walk through the sacrifice with another. He walks through it alone. And that's really important because God isn't saying this is mutual, this is, uh, there's no bartering with me here. This is me making the promise and you either accept it or you reject it. The old covenant of works. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God didn't call Moses up the mountain to negotiate. God didn't have 15 commandments and Moses got him down to ten. Didn't work like that. God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger in stone. Moses brought them down. Accept it or reject it, people. That's how it worked. In the New Testament, we see Jesus sitting at the table in the Last Supper with his disciples. Takes the bread, breaks it. We took communion last week as a church together. Said, eat, this is the, my body, represents my body. Then he took the cup, he passed around, he said, this is... The blood of the new covenant. Now, was it brand new? No. It was a fulfillment of the old covenant. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, the old covenant of works. I came to fulfill it. It was incomplete. The old covenant of works. But the new covenant is of grace. Grace. By the way, the apostle Paul fully understood this. That's why he's writing this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He's saying, look it, you try to live by the law perfectly, you're going to fail. I tried that. I was a Pharisee, you see. He knew it was impossible to obey every command. He writes, the letter kills us. The letter being the law. But the spirit of the living God, he gives life. He gives life. When you read Romans chapter 7, you see how the Apostle Paul struggled with his sin. How we all struggle with our, with our sin. He says, the law kills me. He says, yet if it had not been for the law, I probably wouldn't have known what sin was. But now that it, now that it says, you shall not covet, I realize I covet. <laughs> Isn't that how it works? Someone points out something to you? Oh, man. Do you know the law of Judaism? consists of 613 commands by God. They have 613 commands. That's just a lot to keep track of, isn't it? And then let alone obey it. Now we have to obey all those commands? And the truth is, is that man can't obey any, even one command. I, I mean, let's be honest, right? If there was just one rule, you'd break it. My proof to that is Adam and Eve. They had one rule. Don't eat from the tree. In the Garden of Eden, did they eat? Yes, they did. We can't obey. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? If you say yes and yes, then by your own admission, right, you've broken two of the Ten Commandments. We're, the law, it kills us. It kills us. You might remember Scotty Smalls from the movie Sandlot. And the famous quote, you're killing me, Smalls. The law is like Smalls. It kills us. And God knew this. 
God knew this, of course. He provided a solution, but it was not complete. It was a sacrificial lamb. The Old Testament shows us that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. So year after year, there was a system put into place where the high priest, only the high priest, could enter into the temple, into the place called the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain, and he would take the blood of the lamb and he would pour it out on one day, the Day of Atonement, which we call, they call, the Jewish people call it Yom Kippur. And that appeased God's wrath as well as atoned for the sin of all the people, but only for one year. Every year they had to do it again and again and again. But then Jesus comes. He offers his life on the cross as one final sacrifice. One complete solution. He's the true Passover lamb. His death brings new life. On the third day he rose from the grave. He ascended to heaven. He's alive. He sits there at the right hand of the Father. And as we see in Revelation 4 and 5, he's surrounded by a heavenly host praising his name. Praising his name. He's even referred to as the Lamb in Revelation 4 and 5. And he didn't leave us alone on earth. What did he do? He gave us his Spirit. The Holy Spirit to live in us. To make us ministers of the new covenant. A covenant that brings life, not death. A covenant that has a glory that doesn't fade away. 